Our speaker today is Reverend Dr. Janet P. Aleto. She's a transpersonal psychologist, a complementary health care consultant. She's an ordained minister. She holds a doctorate in biology from New York University and a doctorate in transpersonal psychology from Sabor Graduate School. Um, she is an herbalist. She is working on several books at the minute, I have to say. Um, and she holds a private practice as well in complementary therapy which she resides at, at Temnos, the environmental sanctuary she co-founded with her husband, Piggy. Um, and it's always a delight to have her on our platform, so we uh, welcome Janet this morning to the address. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for that, Janet. Good morning on this magnificent day. I think we had a great storm on Friday. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure we're all happy with that. As Reverend Janet said, um, I'm working on several texts. And what's interesting is I just completed a text now. Four, four, four yesterday, as I said to her, I would like to <laughs> three because that's the divine number of the divine feminine. But so be it, the universe had me finished, so that was good. The book was called, or is called, Entering the Temple Within. And my talk this morning is going to be about going forth by day. It's a beautiful day, it's magnificent, and actually, that's the title of an ancient Egyptian text, which most of you know as the Book of the Dead. <coughs> Interesting how it could be so misinterpreted. The Book of the Dead. That sounds quite finished and stories over. But for the Egyptians, who I personally think were the first spiritualists, and I can go down the list and say to you, Mother and Fatherhood of God, yes, many people can study in ancient Egypt look at the gods and goddesses and completely don't understand how one god could be a goddess in some books and a god in the other, and the name seems to be changed in very little. Because they believed in motherhood and fatherhood of the divine. They couldn't pin it down because they knew that the divine included both and neither. Well, brotherhood and sisterhood of mankind? Absolutely. What most people don't know is that women's live began in Egypt, not here. Many of the great pharaohs were females. Um, try to think of another civilization like ancient Greece at the same time. And I can't name one female queen, no less woman who rose to be king. And yet in Egypt, we can talk about Cleopatra, but most of you know. We can talk about Hatshepsut. Um, we can talk about the fact that they believed in the equality. It definitely existed. When we move down communication of spirits, well, the spiritualists of today wake up. It didn't happen in the 1800s. It was back in Egypt. This is, this is way to go. Uh, they spoke every day to the other side. And probably one of the most fascinating stories that I can tell you is one that's written down, and it's called The Man Who Spoke to His Ba. Now, the Ba was part of the soul. And again, beautiful, interesting people. They did not believe that the soul was one little entity, like one little box or rock, and when you passed away, that one little soul went someplace. And I've often heard people say, well, you know, they'll come to services and they're not getting a message from the medium. What is their beloved doing? Is he on the other side going to school? Is he working? Is he going to somebody else? Let me tell you something. They are everywhere, at every time, they can do anything. I was up 4 o'clock last night translating part of the, what's called the Book of the Dead, which is actually going forth by day, Her M. Haru. That's what the Egyptians would call it. And they're not sleeping, and they really are everywhere. But the man who spoke to his Ba could have been a modern-day man who was disgusted with life, who was disgusted with the government, who was disgusted with his family, who was disgusted with his neighbors, and wanted to commit suicide. Yes, we have this story from ancient <coughs> Egypt. Times were bad, he tells us. And who comes to his rescue? The Ba. The, self, the inner self that lives eternally and forever comes to speak to him and says to him, you know, if you do that, and you misbehave like all of those others who were misbehaving, I'm not ever going to speak to you again. You might laugh and say, well, you know, you're not going to get a communication from the Ba. What he meant was that eternally and forever, even life, 
you're not going to have a very good one. And so the man converses, and this is a wonderful, wonderful story. It's actually called The Weary Man in Conversation with His Ba. The Ba convinces him that life is worth living, and it's worth living well, because you have been given life here, but that's not the end of it. You have been given this life so that you will have something to give to death, to eternity. And by the way, in the Egyptian book, death isn't really mentioned. It's afterlife. It's the duat. And it is what we are to aspire to. And so communication, absolutely. Not only will you communicate, but when your relatives passed, there was a chapel that you visited. And you made an offering. It could have been a voice offering, or if you actually had some fruit and grain you wanted to put, you put it by a false door. And you spoke to that person who passed over, because you didn't believe they were alive. You knew they were alive. And how do I know this? I know this by the way they lived life. They adored life. They lived in the sun. They were, let's face it, by the fertile land that lined the Nile. But they also knew that that life was transient. It was passing. And so everything they did, they prepared for the afterlife. And one of the things they did was certainly continuing to talk to the spirits. And then we talk about the continuing, not only existence of the human soul, but the responsibility. I'll be talking about some of the things I translated last night. And one of them was the fact that they believed when they passed over. They were responsible for what they did here and had to speak up for it. And it's one of the reasons that I chose to wear my manat today. Because on my manat, and those of you who pick it up and feel it say to me, my God, you have to have a strong neck. Um, <laughs> that being, what is created correctly? And it's a copy of something that one of the Egyptian priestesses would have worn. It would have been balanced by the back just as heavy. Because the Egyptians, unlike modern artisans, don't know enough to balance it. And so if I turn around, those of you close enough would be able to see there's a very small dangling piece in the back. And that's the blue lotus. But it is so tiny, it's not going to balance anything. So if I fall over when I speak, you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> the entire reason for this is the scarab. And I'll walk among you for a minute. Most of you know about scarabs. They're beetles. And the Egyptians saw the beetles on the desert. And one of the interesting things is that the female beetle lays her eggs within a bowl of dung, camel dung, on the desert. She rolls it in the sand. And so you have this great big bowl, like the sun, scorching on the sand. And suddenly you have life, new life, coming from what looks like the bowl of eternity. So they picked the scarab as being a symbol of that which gives life supposedly from nothing. Great. The great divine. And by the way, the Egyptians did not believe in many gods. That's not who they prayed to. They prayed to Amun, the hidden one. They believed that divinity was so great that there was no way that one could make a portrait of him or her. But what they did do was they created a myth that all of the gods and goddesses that they prayed to were the gifts of the divine to show us what we should do in life. So that one was for music, and one was for childbirth, and one was for difficulties. And I could go on the list. One was for healing. These were aspects of the divine. And the one pharaoh, Akhenaten, that some of you may know and learn in books as being the first monotheist, absolutely wrong. Um, in my point of view, any Egyptologists that are listening, not a monotheist. He was the only one that looked at the sun and concretized it and said, that's the Aten. That's divinity. And then it got worse because divinity only shone upon him, which is why when he passed away, so did that first trial of this religion. But for the ancients that believed that divinity could not really be portrayed, but it could be known, the scarab had great meaning. And so when they passed away, the scarab was very heavy. The scarab also was placed on the heart. And on the back of it was written a prayer. 
because they believed, like we spiritualists believe, that we're responsible for every act that we do on the planet. And that when we pass over, there will be an examination of consciousness. And that examination of consciousness will be one where our heart contains all that we have done. The heart, according to the Egyptians, had memory. And it was the seat of our being. And it was what went with us beyond. So while the entire body was pulled apart during the mummification process, the brain was thrown out, the liver, the lungs, the, the intestines and the stomach were put in the canopic jaws under the protection of the sons of Horus. The heart was most precious. And it was put back with the body with special ointments and prayers. And when the deceased was laid to rest, a very heavy minot was put on them. And on the back of that minot was the prayer. My heart, my mother, my heart, my mother. My heart whereby I came into being. Do not speak against me. Do not bear witness against me at the judgment. Interesting. It's heavy. And so like I like to think, it's heavy saying to the heart, you know those things I did that I shouldn't have done? Shh, be quiet. <laughs> Don't speak against me at the judgment. The Egyptians lived their life, given life. But the book of coming forth by day Every name that's written in there, your name, the cartouche of the king, is followed by a symbol of the Ankh, as well as a symbol that looks like a pyramid. And it means the Ankh, given life. It's followed by eternally and forever. You see, the belief was, and I have to say the knowing was, that the life that we are given is the eternal life that follows the life we had here. Therefore, they lived their life looking toward eternity. And one of the ways they did this was building their great mansions of millions of years. Most of us know about these ancient people from their tombs. How many of us know about them from the mud the palaces they lived in? There's not one palace that's left where a king actually lived. And by the way, Pharaoh just means house of the great. They actually work with kings. But they spent their life preparing for the afterlife. So given life, the question could come, why? What are we supposed to do with it? We're giving life. What are we doing? I could go on with the tirade of hell and damnation. We should be good because of X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is tell you that if you were an ancient Egyptian, and you tilled the fields. There were taxes, all right? So we didn't invent taxes. The Egyptians did, and we can be thankful that they did, because it did two things for us. One, it helped develop the calendar. And two, yeah, what it ended up doing was giving us an alphabet, giving us a language. The hieroglyphs were created because Egypt did so well. The Nile, the whole uh, fertile valley, brought so much grain that they had to keep track of what they had and where they had bought. And each one would be given a tax that they had to pay. But how interesting, not like our taxes today. The government figured out the plot of land and what you should pay. If you worked that land well and you got more than the government expected, they still wanted what they asked for. So that means you had extra. If you were lazy, well, let's say it was a bad year, too bad. The government knew what they wanted and they collected what they wanted. But the point being, when you had extra, what'd you do with it? It's like today, what'd you do with it when you had extra? Did you plan for your burial? Um, I think of the Egyptian story of Isis and Osiris. And it was a great party. And guess what was the gift at the party? It was a coffin, a sarcophagus. Imagine giving a party today and saying, Come to my Christmas party. I had a coffin. Anybody who fits into it, I'm going to give. Most people wouldn't go to that party. I mean, they totally would freak out. But the Egyptians looked at that because the life that was here was not going to be a long life. And so if you got extra from your fields, guess what? You looked toward your burial. You looked toward your death. Because even in the text, it's 
really not a word. There is a word for death. It's not used very often. Because death has that negative con connotation of end. As spiritualists, we know that that's not true. But the Egyptians were spiritualists. They knew. And you know what? They put their money where their mouth was. They lived it. Quran. They were giving life. Why? That same book of the dead says, given life, that we have something to offer to death. What do we have to offer? What is it that we do in our life that makes us worthy? That's the real question. That's why life is lived. And to me, it's lived well if, in fact, we don't just believe that there's an afterlife. We know that that is what we are aiming toward. So whether there are storms in our life, whether the sky is blotted out with the sun not being able to be seen, there's always that small bit of light that shines that shows us the way. And if we look towards this ancient people, um, and we, we see that they really knew. I translated last night at about 4 o'clock, so it's a bit rusty. But I would like you to hear what was written in the Perk and Hebrew in the Book of Coming into Life, by a man who passed. This is, this is what was on the tomb. So this was his prayer. Hear my words. Music falls from my lips. Honey from the high of heaven, which is the duet. My heart and the scroll of my life are sweet. Truth is the harvest of my days. What was sown, love, anger, bitterness, regret, compassion, each became the bread of my being. Let me say this, beware of what you seed, for the fruit bears the mark of the germ. A bad seed never gave rise to a golden ear of corn. Hear me, O ye who walk upon the earth, let your steps be light, that the earth beneath you is caressed by your death. Is the first environmentalist, you know. Don't trash the land that you're in. Live your life that you may have something worthy to offer to death. Such joys shall be yours. So this is what he knew was waiting for him. Your heart shall sing praises. Your heart will beat in tune with the music of your days. What you were here is what you present to death. Your heart remembers all, so to be quiet for those moments that we were in lapse, recalls all your actions and is a record of your deeds, everything your hands create, and your tongue speaks. Your fortunes may rise and fall, yet the story of your life has a pattern. It rushes on even as your deeds stay firm in great wings. Know this, for I have made a record with myself come to that point where self-conscious, what is it that we did? I have taken note of all I have said and done all my life. My heart sings, for I have achieved the status of the just. And yes, when it says on those tombs walls, given life eternally and forever, the word before it is the just. Your name in the just. The just means that your heart is weighed on the other side so that you may experience life eternal. I come forth by day and I long for nothing. This is eternal. I blaze with the fires, singing a song so stirring, slaves turning the potter's wheel, asses by the river, hear my music, and they raise their heads in horn, the voices that come to us from the other side. Sing the praises of eternity. I am judged worthy of dwelling in the mansion of millions of years, and so shall you be. Given life, let your heart record your noble deeds, that you shall have something worthy to all death. And so I leave you with those words this morning. I have a lot more I translated. Um, enough for a lecture in my four hundred six page book. Um, but the fact is. What is life? Given life, why are we here? What do we do? And truly, it's not a belief in so It's a knowing. Know that there is something, and by knowing that, also know 
Your heart has to speak for you, not against you. And so in every deed you do in every day, you think about that. The nuns used to say to us, I went to a convent school, that for every good deed you have, there's a rose that's put in the heart. For every bad deed that you have, there are thorns. I don't want any thorns in my heart. So hopefully, for each one of you, may you rest and live so you have something worthy to get. Micaiah, the Justice.